Welcome to our first session of our adult confirmation class. Our first class is about Lutheran theology. And so today is our first session and we'll talk about the theological topics of law and gospel. And then in the small catechism, we'll be talking about the Ten Commandments. This is Pastor Jeanette Lisk. I'm pastor at Good Shepherd Lutheran Church in Alexandria, Virginia, and it's good to have you with us. Well, in talking about Martin Luther and his theology, one thing it's important to know that Luther was not a systematic theologian. A systematic theologian is one who puts together theological topics in an ordered, orderly way, a systematic way. So, for example, Thomas Aquinas in his Summa Theologica wrote a text of systematic theological topics. And so if you looked up a topic such as salvation or sin or atonement, you would be able to find that in Thomas Aquinas' work. Not so with Luther. Most of his work was based on the things that he did every day. He was a preacher and he was a teacher. And so he taught uh, primarily Old Testament at Wittenberg University. And at the same time, he was a preacher at St. Mary's Church in Wittenberg. Also important for his context in terms of his theology is that his goal was to preach and teach words of challenge and consolation to those in the Middle Ages who were surrounded by death. The Black Death was a plague that killed about 50% of Europe's population in the Middle Ages. People in Wittenberg and throughout Germany were very aware of the presence of death all around them. So again, as primarily a pastor and teacher, his words were meant for that particular audience. And so to bring challenge and consolation to them um, that who believe that they were close to death. There are three major themes throughout Luther's writings. One is you are called to freedom, that Christ has made you free. Some of you have probably heard that for much of his life, Luther was very concerned about his own personal sin. And he, he felt that he was in bondage to sin. Um, and he was trying to free himself uh, through trying to follow the law as perfectly as he could. And so he self-punished himself. He went to confession frequently, acknowledging that he just could not free himself from the sinful behavior um, that he knew uh, that was part of his life. And so when he discovered in, in the New Testament, and particularly Galatians and Romans, that, that Christ has made you free, that we are uh, accepted and reconciled to God through Christ and not through our own actions, it was extraordinarily liberating. And so throughout his writings, he brings, he wants to bring that, that joy and that call to freedom. And so we'll look for that as we study the small catechism. Another theme and one that we'll talk about more in depth today is law and gospel. And uh, I'll describe that a little bit more later. And then certainly the third theme is justification by grace through faith that we are made right by God through the grace of God, through faith in Jesus and not by our own actions. I'll start off then in thinking about what is gospel? It comes from the word evangelical and it's a Greek word, which means good news. So what is good news? Uh, and as I mentioned just previously for Luther, good news was freedom. Uh, and so when scholars look and try to figure out what was Luther's first reformational text? What was the writing that really got the notice of, of the, the Catholic authorities, the church authorities at that time? Uh, and it comes very early in 1518. Luther wrote this piece, and it's in Latin because Latin was the language of theology. Um, it be, the title begins Pro Veritate, but the title in English is For the Investigation of Truth and for the Comfort of Troubled Souls. Again, Luther was, uh, goal was to preach and teach consolation for people. 
This work is, is a series of 50 theses, items of discussion. You may have heard of Luther's 95 theses. Well, there are other times where he wrote theses as well. And in this text, he uses the Latin word promissio, uh, which he is defined as the gift or the assurance of salvation. This is what gospel is for Luther. It's, it's this free gift, this assurance of salvation. And Luther argues in this text that this gift, the promissio, is what makes one a Christian. That God makes us a Christian. Faith in Christ makes us a Christian and not anything else. And not our uh, relationship to the church, uh, worship, other spiritual practices. Well, Cardinal Cahetan calls us a heresy when Luther is called to Augsburg for a hearing. And so again, this is considered Luther's first reformational text. I find it interesting to think, because it comes up in this text, of what the gospel is for Luther. And what it is, is what it does. Um, for, for Luther, the gospel promissio, the permission, the gift, uh, the promise, is a performative word. It does what it says. So in that text about the 50 theses, he talk, he's talking about the sacrament of penance. And so in one portion of it, he says that the words, I absolve you, in Latin, ego te absolvo, in the traditional way of thinking, the person who was confessing their sin to a priest uh, would show some remorse. And that remorse that the priest would see would be a sign of the reconciliation that had already taken place inside the person. And then the priest would declare it and say, I absolve you. So it would be a declarative word. Well, Luther's understanding is that there isn't anything inward, that in fact, the words of the priest do what they say. So the gospel per promise cannot be spoken to ourselves, but someone who speaks it to us in the name of Jesus. And so when we hear the words, your sins are forgiven, I absolve you, that is what brings us in reconciliation, that the word, the gospel is performative. And so Luther found the gospel promises throughout scripture as well as in our sacraments. And so we hear in Luke, to you is born this day a savior, savior. That is gospel performative word. As we hear that, that happens. The word does something. In the sacrament of Holy Communion, we hear the body of Christ is given for you. In the saying of those words, we are assured of the promise of God's gift of salvation. It does what it says. An interesting corollary from that is if you're wondering where gospel is, where you might meet the gospel promises, where Jesus is present, Luther says that the only means we are guaranteed to hear the promise of God are in word and sacraments. Now, certainly we meet Jesus in many different ways. We meet Jesus through relationships with other people, through nature, through acts of service, but those are where we, we often meet Jesus, but we are guaranteed to meet Jesus and hear the promises of God in word and sacraments. And for Lutherans, there are two sacraments, holy baptism and holy communion. So if that's gospel, if the gospel is gift, the promise of an assurance of salvation, law is different for Luther. And when he discovered that there is a difference between law and gospel, it was surprising to him. Here, uh, I'm dressed up as Luther with my hat. Some people didn't know why I was wearing a hat inside the house. <laughs> um, but here's what Luther says uh, about his discovery of the difference between law and gospel. Previously, I was not deficient in any way, except that I made no distinction between law and gospel, holding both to be the same. And thinking that Christ was to be differentiated from Moses only in regard to when he lived and concerning the level of his perfection.
But after, but after I discovered the difference, the law is one thing and the gospel is another, then I broke through. You can hear the joy uh, in that piece of he's discovering this breakthrough. Well, so for Luther, there are a number of things to think about, about if you're looking and wondering what part of scripture is law and gospel. The law is that part which makes demands on us, that convicts us of our sin, that shows us that we do not do the things that we ought and we fail to do the things that we should. Uh, the law holds up a mirror to us, makes us see who we really are. It's not that the law is bad or that we as Lutheran Christians don't pay attention to the law, that that's all Old Testament thought. Indeed, Luther says that, that the law is holy and good, but it's impossible for us to fulfill perfectly. And so if we were dependent solely on the law for our salvation, we would fail. And so what Luther says is then when we see how imperfect we are, how we fail to complete the things that are we are called to do in the law, he says it drives us to the gospel. It shows us that we are a recipient of a great gift, the promises of God, and that leads to freedom. So this is from his writing on the freedom of a Christian. But how can it be that faith alone can make one righteous and can provide such a super abundant riches apart from all works when it is obvious that so many laws, commands, works, estates, and instructions are prescribed for us in scripture? One ought to note here with diligence and to consider with all seriousness that faith alone, apart from all works, makes one righteous, free, and joyful, about which we will hear more later. And one must know that the entire Holy Scripture is to be divided into two words, the commandments, or the law of God, and the assurances, or the promises. The commandments teach and prescribe for us various good works, but the problem is that they do not thereby actually happen. They indeed do give direction, but they do not help. They teach what a person ought to do, but furnish no power to make something occur. They are thus constructed to show that the human being will see his inability to do the good and will learn to distrust his own ability. From this, he learns to despair of his ability and to seek help elsewhere so that he can live without evil desires. And thus he learns that the law was fulfilled by someone else, which he cannot do on his own. When the human being learns about and has discovered his own powerlessness on the basis of the commandments, that there will be only fear about how he is to do enough of what is asked in the commandment, because the commandment must either be fulfilled or he must be damned, then he is sufficiently humbled and turned into nothing in his own eyes. He does not find anything in himself by means of which he can be righteous. Following upon this comes the other word, the divine assurance and promise, promissio, which says, if you want to fulfill all the commandments, if you want to be free of your evil desires and sins as the commandments pressure and demand, look here believe in Christ, through whom I promise you all grace, righteousness, peace, and freedom. If you believe, you have it. If you do not believe, you do not have it. For what is impossible for you by means of all the works of the commandments, which are many and which still cannot be of any value, is made simple and easy for you through faith. For God has made all things depend on faith so that whoever has it shall have all things and be joyful. Whoever does not have it shall have nothing. This is what the promises of God provide. What the commandments demand. They fulfill what the commandments demand so that everything is from God himself, both commandment and fulfillment. <laughs> 
He alone commands. He alone fulfills. So Luther says, God alone commands and God alone fulfills. That the liberating piece of this, the promise, is that Jesus has fulfilled the commandments perfectly. And again, if you think a little bit about the context, surrounded by death, people worried about salvation. It's very close to them. But I was talking to what, some of our groups talking about this text and, and saying that I don't think I meet many people who live their daily lives uh, worried about whether or not um, they have fulfilled the commandments and having this angst that Luther had about our uh, uh, upcoming judgment and whether God has has declared them as as their as God's own or whether that they are eternally uh, condemned. Uh, I think part of it is the influence of Luther, um, but also I think we are far, much farther separated from death uh, than at the time of Luther's day. So as a preacher, as a pastor, preaching to people, uh, this, again, is an extraordinary message of hope, uh, of freedom. And I just took a deep breath myself as I said that, as you can imagine, the gift that this was for people that to this point had been trying and trying and trying and trying to fulfill the commands of God. And here Luther is saying, that God has already fulfilled those commands. I'm going to move then to Luther's catechisms. Luther wrote two catechisms, both in 1529. And actually, his colleagues had started uh, writing things down in the catechism. But then Luther himself um, found the time or was frustrated enough by their efforts that he started to write his own. Uh, he wrote the small catechism and the large catechism. The, the word catechism comes from kateko, a Greek word which means to sound again or to sound forth. Oops, I'll go back. <laughs> I guess I can't go back. Um, so kateko means to sound forth or to sound again. And by the second century, it became known just as instruction before baptism. So a catechism as an instructional piece typically used before baptism. Uh, if you can think of the word kateko meaning to sound forth or to sound again, I'm not quite sure, but I believe this comes from the fact that, especially with small catechisms, and there are multiple catechisms, uh, that people were to recite them over and over and over again until they became part of themselves. And so it, it, they learned by this reputation, repetition, the sounding forth, the sounding again. His writings in the catechisms became started as sermons and we actually have, have some of his sermons that that follow along with the writing of, of his catechisms it was typical in the middle ages that on ember days these were four times of year of particular fasting and prayer and reflection times that during the days the those days on worship times, they would be the official times when, when pastors were to preach about the catechism. So again, this is where much of the material came from. You see the picture here, this is St. Mary's Church where Luther was the preacher, um, both the outside and the interior. And this is in Wittenberg, Germany. So his small catechism. What happened is Luther was visiting some rural churches in Saxony, and he recognized the need for Christian instruction. The small catechism was meant for heads of household. It was addressed to them to be taught in the home. And the original German versions, you see a picture of an early German version, but the original ones also had appendices, including the, the marriage service, the baptism service, household prayers, as well as a chart of Bible passages for the household, which is called the Table of Duties. Let's listen to what Luther says about the small catechism, about why he found the need to write it. You get a 
an idea of some of Luther's salty language. The deplorable, wretched deprivation that I recently encountered while I was a visitor has constrained and compelled me to prepare this catechism or Christian instruction in such a brief, plain, and simple version. Dear God, what misery I beheld! The ordinary person, especially in the villages, knows absolutely nothing about the Christian faith. And unfortunately, many pastors are completely unskilled and incompetent teachers. So Luther didn't mince words. <laughs> in terms of the format of the small catechism, again, Luther's catechism wasn't much different from other catechisms. He often begins with a question, as we'll see, was ist das, or what is this? Uh, and the format moves from law, the Ten Commandments, to gospel. And Luther saw gospel in the creed and the Lord's Prayer. The original editions were accompanied by woodcuts, and you see the one on the right, uh, which accompanied the first commandment, and it shows God and Moses receiving the Ten Commandments. Interesting note that in the original, the appendices of the, which had the baptism service, it was removed in 1580, because of its reference to exorcism. One line was, depart you unclean spirit and make room for the Holy Spirit. The large catechism, while the, the small catechism was meant to be used in the household, large catechism was meant to teach the clergy. And one thing that's interesting is from the very beginning, there was some disagreement about its wording. Uh, Johannes Agricola, and you see his picture here, or John Agricola, <laughs> and uh, what he wanted Luther to talk about is that repentance followed an understanding of the love of God, that when you look at the Ten Commandments, the reason that you follow them is because of a love of God. Well, Luther saw that as, as being the opposite direction, that we move from law to gospel, as I talked before. And so he thought the fear of God was the primary motive. But nevertheless, Luther compromised. And so he said, uh, in the catechism, we'll hear in the explanation of the Ten Commandments over and over again, we are to fear and love God so that we, and then he follows with his explanation. So here, in this tape, we'll hear the pref from the preface of the large catechism about Luther's understanding about why we should study the catechism and why he himself does. Many regard the catechism as a simple trifling teaching, which they can absorb and master at one reading and then toss the book into a corner as if they are ashamed to read it again. Indeed, among the nobility, there are also some louts and skinflints who declare that they can do without pastors and preachers now because they have everything in books and can learn it all by themselves. So they blithely let parishes fall into decay and brazenly allow both pastors and preachers to suffer distress and hunger. This is what one can expect of crazy Germans. We Germans have such disgraceful people among us and have to put up with them. But this I say for myself. I am also a doctor and a preacher, just as learned and experienced as all of them who are so high and mighty. Nevertheless, each morning and whenever else I have time, I do as a child who is being taught the catechism. And I read and recite word for word the Lord's Prayer, the Ten Commandments, the creeds, the Psalms, etc. I must still read and study the Catechism daily, and yet I cannot master it as I wish, but must remain a child and pupil of the Catechism. And I also do so gladly. Luther used his Catechism daily, and it is part of his recommendation and, and uh, when people, again, as a pastor, he had people coming and wondering how best to confess sin and how to examine one's conscience. And Luther talked about using the small catechism, going through the Ten Commandments, 
um, and the explanations and, and identifying where uh, we have failed to meet up to God's commands and using it. So it was very much a part of Luther's life, as you heard. So we are moving then to our first section in, in the small catechism, the Ten Commandments. A couple things, just uh, general things about his view of the Ten Commandments. He thought that they were in decreasing order of importance. So that the first commandment was the most important commandment of them all. To, and it, he said, was to illuminate and impart its splendor to all the others. First commandment being, you shall have no other gods. Now, the other thing to note is that Luther was not a biblical literalist. And he believed that the Ten Commandments were meditations by Moses on the law that God had written on human hearts. So not that, that Moses, dic God dictated to Moses, um, but actually that, that what Moses, um, and at that time Luther thought that Moses was indeed the person who wrote the Ten Commandments, but they were God inspired on human heart, right, but written by Moses, which is how we ELCA Lutherans continue to understand the Bible as being written by humans, inspired by God. The other interesting thing that might be surprising is that he didn't think that everything in the Bible was applicable to Christians. You know, one of the things he notes that in the beginning of the Ten Commandments in the prologue, it says in scripture, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt. Well, certainly um, we weren't brought out of the land of Egypt. And so he thought some, uh, especially again, he was an Old Testament scholar, uh, some things were related to the specific situation of the Israelites and not applicable to us either in the Middle Ages or to us today. The first commandment, I put an asterisk next to first because the numbering of the commandments is different. And if you see Luther's numbering, it's different from what we see in Exodus 20 and Deuteronomy 5, the scriptural basis of the commandments. Uh, my tr the translations that I'm using here to talk about each of the commandments is from the Book of Concord, Timothy Wengert's translation. So it's different uh, in some ways from your small catechisms. Um, the first commandment is you are to have no other gods. Luther asks, what is this? We are to fear, love, and trust God above all things. I think Luther has an interesting way to think about what are our gods, little g. One of Luther says we all have gods, and the way to de determine what is our God, capital G, is he says that to which your heart clings and entrusts itself is really your God. So we might think, what in times of stress do we cling to? Uh, time of uh, disturbance, anxiety, joy, uh, whatever we put our trust in, wherever we put our highest value in, that is our God. And so in the large catechism, he talks about there are some who think they have God and everything they need when they have money and property. So too with those who boast of great learning, wisdom, power, prestige, family, and honor. They have a God also but not the one true God. And he says, going after God's idolatry is a matter of the heart, which fixes its gaze upon other things and seeks help and consolation from creatures, saints, or devils. So again, if we are examining our own consciences, where do we place our gaze upon uh, when we are looking for help and consolation? Um, and there are many things in our lives that may take the place of the one true God. About this commandment is, is that there's another way of worshiping a, a false God, a false worship. He says it involves that conscience that seeks help, comfort, and salvation in its own works and presumes to wrest heaven from God. So again, here Luther brings his theme of justification by grace through faith into the, his explanation of this commandment and saying, you know, that though it's false worship to think that we are the ones and the only ones who can get at us out of messes, um, that, uh, that what we do is 
uh, is of the highest value and what will be ultimate in our lives. When uh, what Luther says that tries to wrest heaven from God, it's a wonderful phrase there. He moves on to the second commandment. You are not to take the name of God in vain. What is this? We are to fear and love God so that we do not curse, swear, practice magic, lie, or deceive using God's name, but instead use that very name in every time of need to call on, pray to, praise, and give thanks to God. A large part of his large catechism in talking about this is based on a uh, court where people would swear on God's name and then commit perjury. And so he talks about this is a misuse of God's name. Uh, it was typical at the time that um, people would bear false witness, and that's talked about in the later commandments, but in court using God's name and thereby enrich themselves. And so Luther talks about this as a matter of breaking this, this commandment to, to not misuse God's name. He also says that it's part of the marriage oath that when you are misusing God's name, when you betray that oath. And then also in spiritual matters that we betray God's name when there's false preaching. And of course, at the time Luther was uh, talking about his, his fellow Roman Catholic uh, preachers and what he considered a false doctrine. And then Luther goes on to say that there is a proper use of God's name, that we use God's name in service of truth, that is the proper way, that when we call on God in times of need or thanks and praise, that those are also proper uses of God's name. The third commandment here is you are to hallow the day of rest. You may have this as remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. What is this? We are to fear and love God so that we do not despise preaching or God's word, but instead keep that word holy and gladly hear and learn it. So we'll talk about it a little bit more, but it's interesting as you just look at this explanation. You know, he doesn't talk about in his small catechism a time of rest or relaxation. He really sees this day of rest as being an opportunity to hear God's word. In, in preaching and, and worship. So the large catechism says that this commandment does not concern us Christians. It is entirely external matter, like the other regulations of the Old Testament associated with particular customs, persons, times, and places, from all of which we are now set free through Christ. Again, that theme of freedom. So this may be surprising again that he says that, that this was from times of the Israelites and it was related to, to them and not particularly to us. Um, one of his thoughts was that, well, on the Sabbath, that was Saturday at uh, the time, um, that everyone worked. And so that, that commandment couldn't possibly for, be for us. Um, and he, Luther wasn't much for making a Sabbath, changing it to Sunday. Uh, he talks about that in his, his large catechism as well. Um, but he does do some writing about holy days, and he says that holy days are important. He says we observe them first because our bodies need them. So he does talk about the need for rejuvenation and renewal um, for our physical bodies. Uh, but he says second and most important, we observe them so that people will have time and opportunity on such days of rest to attend worship services so that they may assemble to hear and discuss God's word and then to offer praise, song, and prayer to God. The first three commandments are directed about our relationship to God, whereas the last seven are related to our relationship to other human beings. And again, in Luther's understanding that the commandments are in order of importance and decreasing order of importance, for him, this fourth commandment, honor your father and your mother, is the most important of the commandments related to our neighbors. What is this? Luther says we are to fear and love God so that we neither despise nor anger our parents and others in authority, but instead honor, serve, obey, love, and respect them.
So one of the things that Luther says in his, new, his large catechism about this commandment is that it must therefore be impressed on young people that they revere their parents as God's representatives and to remember that however lowly, poor, feeble, and eccentric they may be, they are still their mother and father given by God. And he goes on to say, when God wants to speak with us, he does not avail himself of an angel, but of parents. Now, of course, here, as in much of scripture, parts of this, this catechism can be used for ill in terms of abusive people in authority, including parents. And so it's important to point out here that, um, that Luther's understanding was contextual as well. Luther himself had a difficult relationship with his parents. His parents were Hans and Margareta Luther. His father was a successful copper smelter and his mother was from a small but well-off family. So a couple quotes he talks about his parents. He says, my father once whipped me so hard I ran away. I hated him until he finally managed to win me back. And then about his mother, he said, for the sake of stealing a nut, my mother once beat me until the blood flowed. Now, again, this is in the Middle Ages, and I'm not sure in terms of typical parenting uh, disciplinary techniques. Uh, but one of the things that it seems clear is that Luther uh, was afraid of his parents at some points. Um, he, his parents expected him to become a lawyer, and you may remember he had that apocryphal event in his life when he was in the middle of a storm and prayed to St. Anne to save him, and if he was saved from the storm, that he would become a monk. And he was saved from the storm, and he did become a monk. Well, convention would say that he would talk to his father before uh, becoming uh, changing his occupation, his vocation, and he didn't. He went uh, directly to become a monk. So he disobeyed his parents. <laughs> um, the other th interesting story is that when he was sharing Holy Communion, presiding at the table for the first time, his father came to worship, and Luther was shaking. Um, he saw his father there, and he had... Uh, an enormous uh, emotional response to his father's being there. So he had a, had a complex relationship with his own parents. The other important thing to see about this commandment though, is that Luther doesn't talk just about your blood relatives, your parents. He says that when, when this commandment talks about father and mother, talking about four kinds of fathers. So indeed fathers by blood, but also fathers of a household. So that would be schoolmasters that came to teach and others in authority in the household. He talked about fathers of the nation. So government leaders were included in this commandment, as well as religious leaders, the spiritual fathers were included in this commandment. And again, if you think about how he said that we are to love, honor, respect, and obey them, he didn't always love, honor, respect, and obey, especially the religious leaders of his day. Another key thing in his large catechism is he says that all of these types of, of parents, people in authority, fathers, have a responsibility. And he talks a bit about how a responsibility toward the physical and, and, and well-being of those under their charge so that uh, those in authority are, are not given free reign to do as they please, but with that authority comes responsibility. And I think we can think about how important that is today as well. The fifth commandment, you are not to kill. What is this? We are to fear and love God so that we neither endanger nor harm the lives of our neighbors but instead help and support them in all of life's needs. When you think of this commandment as you shall not kill, what, what Luther says, what is forbidden here applies to individuals, not to the government officials. 
So Luther in, in the large catechism did not uh, believe that this applied in terms of the death penalty um, by government leaders. Over the years, the ALCA has done a social statement about the death penalty and comes based on scripture and to other understandings, but, but this is what Luther said in his large catechism. The other couple of things in his large catechism, he talks about this commandment. He says, the meaning of this commandment then is that no one should harm another person for any evil deed, no matter how much that person deserves it. And so he says, this commandment is violated not only when we do evil, but also when we have the opportunity to do good to our neighbors and to prevent, protect, and save them from suffering bodily harm or injury, but fail to do so. I think this is key, key for Luther that, um, and we'll see in the subsequent commandments too, that in relationship to the neighbor, it's not only what we do, but what we fail to do. Another of our ELCA social statements talks about economic justice, and it uses some of Luther's explanation of the commandments to talk about how the fact that when we fail to uh, allow our, our neighbors to make a livelihood, um, that when there is economic injustice, that that breaks these commandments of harming them. Um, even though it's it's uh, it's not necessarily you should the commandment is you shall not kill but by but we harm them even through economic means. The sixth commandment is you are not to commit adultery. What is this? We are to fear and love God so that we lead pure and decent lives in word and deed, and each of us loves and honors his or her spouse. Now in the large catechism here. Luther talks about his understanding that was different from the religious leaders of the day. So at that time, religious understanding was that those who were single, those who were celibate, were on a higher spiritual plane than those who were married. And so the more spiritual people were in monasteries and nunneries. And that was a higher estate than the marriage estate. Well, Luther says here that you should carefully note first how highly God honors and praises this walk of life, meaning marriage, endorsing and protecting it by this commandment. You see that our papal crowd, priests, monks, and nuns resist God's ordinance and commandment when they despise and forbid marriage. This commandment requires all people to love and cherish the spouse whom God has given them. It is essential that husband and wife live together in love and harmony, cherishing each other wholeheartedly and with perfect fidelity. As an aside, so Luther did get married. Uh, the story is that Catherine von Bora was one of the nuns that escaped the nunnery in a fish barrel. She uh, reportedly was the last of the nuns not to get married. And someone said to Luther, hey, Luther, there's another uh, nun. Would, I think you should get married. Um, and he hadn't really thought it for himself, but then they did get married and it turned to, to be a wonderful partnership. Um, she was 16 young, years younger than Martin and they had six children as well as raising six of Luther's sister's children. At their home in Wittenberg, they would often have students around their table. And so Catherine von Bora was in charge of, of handling the household expenses, including providing meals for 30 odd people around the table day after day uh, who were taking notes as, as Luther talked. And those notes became what's called Luther's table talk. So she was managing the household's expenses and garden, gardening and brewery and had quite uh, a business life uh, as Luther's wife. The seventh commandment is you are not to steal. What is this? We are to fear and love God so that we neither take our neighbor's money nor property nor acquire them by using shoddy merchandise or crooked deals, but instead help them to improve and protect their property and income. <laughs> 
So what Luther says, to steal is nothing else than to acquire someone else's property by unjust means. These few words including include taking advantage of our neighbors and any sorts of dealings that result in loss to them. So he expands this commandment and he says, for example, a servant who is working for an employer and then wastes things or is negligent with them breaks this commandment, they are stealing. Artisans and workers who overcharge or are negligent, they are stealing. A business person who sells a defective item is stealing or who hoards. It's interesting to think, of course, in the Middle Ages, people it, were interested in buying things if they could, and uh, a business person could cause a rise in prices by hoarding them, not putting them on the shelves. And so Luther says, this is stealing, falsely increasing the price of items. He talked about armchair bandits. These are people in power who, because of their power, were able to take advantage of others. And he said, that's stealing. Also something we could think about today. Arch thieves, beyond that, these are extremely powerful leaders. And he talks about church leaders included in this who plunder cities. That's stealing. As in part of this com commandments conversation, he says, beware of how you deal with the poor. As King Solomon also teaches in Proverbs 19, whoever is kind to the poor lends to the Lord. The eighth commandment is you are not to bear false witness against your neighbor. What is this? We are to fear and love God so that we do not tell lies about our neighbors, betray or slander them or destroy their reputations. Instead, we are to come to their defense, speak well of them and interpret everything they do in the best possible light. So bear false language about the court system. And he talks a lot about bearing false witness in court. Uh, it sounds like during the Middle Ages that there was a lot of people who were doing this <laughs> to take advantage of others. Um, he does talk about gossip. He says, learning about a bit of gossip about someone else, they spread it in every corner, relishing and delighting in the chance to stir up someone else's dirt like pigs that roll in manure and root around in it with their snouts. Quite an image there. He says, if you know something, keep it to yourself and do not tell others. And yet he also is aware that certain things need to come out in the open, certain kinds of evil. And he said the right way to deal with this matter would be to follow the rule laid down by the gospel, Matthew 18, where Christ says, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. And most of our ELCA constitutions have this as a way to deal with uh, difficulties in the congregation is... Um, avoiding gossip, but going directly to the person. And if um, it's not satisfied one-on-one, -on -one, then to bring somebody else with you. And, and there's a whole process in our constitutions. In his explanations, Luther groups the ninth and 10th commandments together. Uh, ninth is you are not to covet your neighbor's house. What is this? We are to fear and love God so that we do not try to trick our neighbors out of their inheritance or property or try to get it for ourselves by claiming to have a legal right to it and the like, but instead be of help and service to them in keeping what is theirs. And the tenth, you are not to commit covet to your neighbor's wife, male or female servants, cattle, or whatever is his. What is this? We are to fear and love God so that we do not entice, force, or steal away from our neighbors, their spouses, household workers, or livestock, but instead urge them to stay and fulfill their responsibilities to our neighbors. I might wish that Luther didn't uh, 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 talk, would make a distinction between people as property, but he doesn't. Um, and talk about um, the fact that he, in his understanding, these two, two commandments taken literally were given exclusively to the Jews, again, not for Christians. But he says there are some parts that apply to us such as nature, that no one wants to, someone else to have as much as he or she does. Everyone tries to accumulate as much as he or she can and lets others look out for himself. We hunt for and think of clever tricks and shrewd tactics to conceal our villainy, 
So he, instead of doing that, Luther says, instead we are to gladly let them have what is theirs, and this is key, and to promote and protect whatever may be profitable and serviceable to them. So again, not only do we avoid taking or wanting to take what is theirs or conspiring to take what is theirs, but to actively look for ways for people uh, to protect what is, what is theirs. At the end of the Ten Commandments, we talked about law and gospel. Certainly the law is uh, embodied most familiarly in the Ten Commandments. And what Luther says, again, is that the law should show us how we fail to, to fulfill the law and drive us to the gospel. In his words, no one is able to keep even one of the Ten Commandments as it ought to be kept. Both the creed and the Lord's Prayer must come to our aid, as we shall hear later. And again, next week, we will talk about the creed. Have a good day.